I need to go get a haircut. My, my, thank you, Mike. <laughs> my, my wife looked at my hair yesterday and she's like, you need a haircut. <laughs> it, it's, it's especially pronounced on formats like Zoom. I look like I'm wearing a really bad toupee. <laughs> oh, goodness. So the um, the attendee list is opened up. So we'll we'll give them about a minute or two to get everybody kind of signed in, and then um, and then we can get started. That sounds great. <clears throat> is it going to be a hundred degrees again today, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna be 100 degrees today. <laughs> I think this is gonna be our first 100 degree day today. So, <laughs> hope hope everybody is in a very comfortably air conditioned environment and uh, enjoying the uh, hopefully very efficient uh, uh, air conditioning units this summer. <laughs> Well, it's um, it's eleven thirty one, and we have several people signed on. So, um, Sam, Mike, whenever you guys are ready, we can go ahead and get started. Great. Well, I think I think we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, I'm Sam Foreman. Um, I'm a, a business attorney here uh, in Wichita. Uh, very proud to call this place home. Uh, moved down here uh, for work about ten years ago. Grew up in tropical Topeka, Kansas. Um, <clears throat> Love being down here. I think this is a great town. I think there's a, a lot of really cool stuff going on. Uh, it's been very interesting to watch the recent chatter on Century 2 and <laughs> some of the options there. And um, we, do, we work with a lot of small businesses. We work with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, startups, uh, you know, wills and trusts, nonprofits, um, do a variety of different things. Um, but we really love working with folks that are buying or selling businesses. Um, it's it's a, a lot of fun getting to see see folks on the uh, on the buy side of things as they're starting to really build out their dream often um, or expand uh, the dream that they're working on uh, or on the sell side of things um, getting to work with folks that have spent their lives um, or a substantial portion of their lives getting to build something that that really matters to them and trying to help um, figure out how to maximize the value that they're then able to um, pass on to uh, their families or charitable causes. Um, and so that's something we enjoy a lot. Um, Mike joined our team, uh, gosh, almost a year ago, <laughs> getting close to it. Um, uh, he works with a lot of business transactional needs on our team as well as intellectual property matters like licensing, trademark stuff. Um, he's very, very sharp, uh, does a great job uh, for our clients. Uh, he's also a tremendous hockey player. Um, he's, he, is, he is blessed with athletic uh, capabilities um, that I only see on TV. Um, I'm, I'm not an athlete. For those that have met me before, um, they can certainly attest to that. So we're excited to be talking with you all today. Um, uh, our style is to just be very interactive. So if you have questions as we're going along, um, please don't hesitate to raise a hand and ask those as we're going through. Um, we'll do our best to kind of monitor those and, and respond in real time um, as best we can. Um, <clears throat> so, wouldn't be a presentation by lawyers without a legal disclaimer. Um, this presentation is for informational purposes only and is not intended as legal advice. No attorney-client relationship is formed by this presentation. Um, we're happy to field general questions, but uh, certainly want to be sensitive not to 
um, not, not to go over the bounds on anything. So throw, throw, don't hesitate to throw your questions at us and we'll do our best to answer or um, let you know how, how we can respond um, in another, another format. Um, so we've got some, some bonus points on here. Uh, certainly want to talk about the, the deal process itself. Um, want to talk about initial negotiations, uh, building your team, letters of intent and term sheets. Uh, talk about due diligence uh, and then documenting the deal itself. Uh, and then want to talk uh, with you all about what happens after the deal. Um, I think it's a, a good way to think about it is like um, uh, romantic comedies, uh, you know, frequently at the, at the very end of the movie is the wedding. And that's, you know, that's like the deal closing. Um, it's what everybody gets excited about and then it's over. But um, as anyone who's, who's bought a, a business before can attest, that's really just the beginning. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into um, now maximizing on that investment that you've made in a business. Um, and if you're on the sell side, transitioning that value to the buyer. So, um, <clears throat> so let's let's talk a little bit about the deal process um, from a from a timeline standpoint. And and of course, this is just a generality. And certainly, you should assume that all of the things <laughs> we're talking about today are really broad generalities. We want to provide useful information, but there's lots of exceptions to all the general rules that we're talking about. Um, on a timeline, uh, you should assume that, a de that any deal is going to take at least 60 to 90 days from when it really gets going um, to when the deal is actually closed. Um, some deals from, you know, the first conversation that the buyer and seller have to um, the actual closing can take six months. Um, I've seen them happen in 30 days. Uh, but uh, even when everybody is moving as quickly as they can, it's really common for things to take 60 to 90 days to get done. Um, uh, you've got initial negotiations um, that are frequently going to take place first. You know, buyer and seller are going to kind of feel each other out and see, hey, um, is there even a deal here? Are we close enough on key points um, to start um, really getting into spending money with um, our deal teams to, to make this thing a reality? Um, then you've got, um, uh, you know, initial due diligence. You know, once, once there's enough interest and there's enough um, of an idea that there's there could be or or there's likely to be a deal here, um, then everyone can get into to initial due diligence, um, can get into really starting to go through those initial terms, working through um, a letter of intent, a term sheet, um, then the financing process. Um, you know, many folks are are obtaining financing from the SBA or from some other lender or or investors. Um, and those, you know, those financing deals frequently will require that you're to a particular point um, in the deal process to where you know enough about the deal terms, you know enough about the assets and the liabilities and, and everything else involved that, that then the, you know, the, the bank or the investors can understand enough to, to provide the appropriate financing. Um, then, then there's frequently additional negotiations and diligence as you're constantly learning about um, the business that's being acquired, um, as you're constantly learning about, you know, how the relationship with the other party is going to, uh, to function, um, that's, that back and forth can continue throughout the process. Um, then once, you know, once the parties know enough about the deal and about what the deal is going to look like, and there's been enough disclosure and there's been enough learning about things through the process, um, then, then uh, it's more typical to start really getting into the documentation of the deal, um, you know, the purchase agreements, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, after all of that, there's the closing on the deal. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what happens after closing? Well, there's all these these post-closing issues, you know, transitioning the business, you know, from the seller to the buyer, introductions to key parties um, in the process, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, let's talk about initial negotiations. Um, Really, what this process is all about is just trying to figure out: Is there even a deal here? Um, do the part are the parties interested enough to really make a good deal happen, uh, or is this something where um, you know one party's really interested and the other isn't? Um, it's very much like dating in that sense. Um, you know, if one party's really interested and the other is not, <laughs> there's not a deal there. Um, 
Uh, and so there's there's a um, you you always want to be sensitive to confidential information uh, in that process. Um, you want to be thinking about you know if you're the seller and you're thinking about disclosing things, do you have um, an NDA in place? When, if at all, do you need an NDA in place? Um, the lawyer answer is always get an NDA. Always um, and make sure that it protects uh, the information so that you don't have some unexpected exposure. Um, but there's frequently a lot of times where from a practical standpoint, you can have conversations that have enough detail um, without disclosing anything that's particularly sensitive. But you wanna be very, very careful with that. Definitely talk to um, your professional advisors before um, going forward with conversations without an NDA in place, um, especially if you're the seller, but also if you're the buyer. Um, if you're the buyer, you may wanna make sure that those conversations are confidential and that the fact that you're talking to a buyer doesn't doesn't leak out or that you're talking to someone that you might acquire um, you don't want that to leak out either um, for a number of reasons um, you don't want the market to know about it don't want um, other folks that might use that to then start a bidding war um, and you also want to be respectful of the seller um, that's involved um, during during those initial negotiations uh, you really want to try to nail down enough detail about what the deal is going to look like um, so that uh, so that you're you're confident that a deal is actually going to happen and that it's worth everyone's time and money to pursue. Um, if you don't have enough detail, and we see this happen occasionally, if you don't have enough detail, you create a, a serious risk that everyone spends a bunch of time and ultimately a bunch of money, and then gets into the process and finds out that um, there just isn't a deal here, and you know now you're out that time and money. Um, you definitely want to think about purchase price. Um, as, as you're negotiating the purchase price, you want to avoid being stuck in a position where you've made such a hard commitment as either the, the seller or the buyer um, that there's not enough flexibility for key changes in the process. Um, for example, <clears throat> if you have um, a working capital target or, or some other um, measure that's, that's factored into the purchase price, <clears throat> you want to have enough flexibility that if you're the seller, and you land some big sale, <coughs> excuse me, um, or some other significant uptick occurs, that it's natural to go back to the buyer and say, hey, I've got great news. I just closed this deal. Um, this is, you know, this is a really exciting thing for our business. <coughs> excuse me. Um, but, but here's also how this is going to affect the purchase price. And then it becomes a natural part of, well, hey, this is, you know, something we've already talked about. Um, and here's how it already fits in. So it's less it's more of a natural outflow of the conversations you've already had and less of a um, uh, less of a it's going to feel less like eh, what are you trying to do change the deal terms on me <laughs> so um, and similarly from the buyer side you want to make sure that there's enough flexibility built in so that if something happens and the value goes down that it's a natural conversation that doesn't undermine you know the deal as a whole assuming that it's still a good deal at that point um, you want to make those conversations as easy as possible. Um, one of the concepts we, we frequently try to talk to our clients about is this idea of relational capital. Um, if you think about it, it's like you've got a certain, uh, you've got an account with a certain balance in it when you're making a deal. And the balance can change all the time, but you can actually, if you want to think about it this way, you can spend relational dollars to get things during the deal process. Um, frequently, you know, in most deals, you're going to need to ask for a favor um, from the other party. Um, hey, you know, we missed this. You know, we'd like to have this in there. Um, you know, want to, <clears throat> oops, excuse me, getting too far ahead here. Um, uh, you know, need to ask for this concession or this change, whatever it might be. Um, and if you, do a really good job maintaining that relationship, you can maintain that balance to where you've got enough of uh, a good relationship with the other party in the deal to get all the way through the deal process. Because um, stuff's gonna happen in a deal where you know people get tired, they get tired of lawyers, they get tired of accountants, they get tired of the other side uh, in the transaction and deal fatigue sets in and then that really starts to increase the risk that the deal falls apart and that there's no deal after everybody gets all the way through that um, through that process that uh, the end is that there's just no deal there. Um, and so be mindful of that. Make sure you're maintaining those good relationships, not just because it's the right thing to do and because um, it makes the deal process a lot more fun, but it genuinely can 
um, help uh, improve the, the outcome of the transaction itself. Um, another good reason to do that, and this is really important, um, is, uh, to, is because you, you're likely going to have to work with the other party after the deal closes. You know, you're not done with each other at that point. And so you want to have a good enough relationship to have conversations and, and work things out as opposed to, you know, just saying, well, my attorney is going to call your attorney and they're going to work it out because <laughs> that gets expensive um, and uh, pretty quickly. And, and it's, it's seldom as, um, as, as uh, productive as two business folks just kind of working it out uh, and then telling their legal teams how, how it needs to be structured. Although the lawyer answers always talk to the lawyer first. Um, uh, think about the structure of the transaction. Is it going to be an asset deal? Is it going to be a stock deal? Um, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of that here, uh, but in general, you know, many um, sellers prefer that it be a stock sale or, or sale of the ownership in an LLC um, for tax reasons, as opposed to um, it being an asset deal. But of course, that varies widely based on a number of considerations. You want to think about not only the taxes, the tax ramifications on uh, the transaction and how that's going to affect the economics of the deal for the buyer and the seller. But you also want to think about the risk involved. You know, how much risk um, is there from buying a business and stepping into, um, if, you're, if it's a stock deal, um, taking on all the liabilities of the business, at least all the ones that aren't, you know, paid off and released at closing. Uh, and then from, you know, if it's an asset deal, are you going to be able to get all the contracts that you need um, so that you don't have to go get a bunch of third party consents? Um, to keep contracts during the process. Uh, really think about and spend a lot of time thinking about the key value. Um, what is the key value that you as the seller or the buyer um, are trying to obtain out of the transaction? Um, you know, if you're the buyer, is it is it that you, you want the purchase price structured in a particular way to, to get you um, the best tax treatment that you can possibly get to maximize the particular dollars? Is it that you want to sell the business and then you want to be able to continue to you know, work in the business for a while? Um, think about think about all those details. Is it you know having some say in the future of the business? Um, you know, maybe it's a legacy um, item for you where you've built something of significance that has your name attached to it, um, you know, either directly or indirectly, and, and you want to make sure that that's um, handled properly. Those are those are things you want to think about. Um, in front, you know, from the buyer side, is it is it key assets? Is it key people? Is it key business relationships? What is it that really drives the value? And to make sure you understand that, um, and spend some time thinking about how what drives the key value for the other party. Um, there's a lot of circumstances that we run into where you, where people assume as they're negotiating the deal um, that the other party thinks about the key value the same way that they do. Um, and that's that's frequently incorrect. And so if you take the time to be really intentional about understanding and being you know somewhat specific for yourself about what the other party values, you'll put yourself in a better position when you get to those key negotiating points to be able to say, okay, I think you know this is what I really need. Um, I remember that the other party really values this thing. I really want this piece. Maybe I can ask for, Maybe I can make a trade off and then you create value in the negotiation process by getting something that you want in exchange for giving up something that they want more. And so they're getting, you know, in that instance, they're getting more than what they're giving up. And so are you. And that creates value. Um, but in order to do that, you really got to focus in on understanding what the key value for you is and what the key value for the other party is. Um, the same thought process applies when thinking about key risks. You know, really take the time to understand where is the risk on this business um, that I'm selling uh, or, or the risk to me in the transactional structure um, or the risk as a buyer um, so that you're in a position to understand how, how you need to negotiate, how you need to position um, the deal um, and to understand are you even making the right kind of deal for yourself. Um, and that's where your professional team can do a good job trying to help you understand those things and position it appropriately. Um, one, one thing that's I think is often missed is when somebody is positioning for sale or when they're buying is um, to not think about the really key people that are involved. Um, 
you know, a lot of businesses, particularly small businesses um, that are being bought or sold are very relationship dependent or very, you know, knowledge, know-how dependent. And if key people are just all of a sudden not in the picture anymore, um, that can pose a substantial risk to a business. Um, and certainly bankers understand that as they're financing deals uh, and can take that into account pretty heavily. Um, <clears throat> Here's some additional terms to consider. Um, think about payment terms. Um, is, it, is the entire purchase price due at closing? Um, if the buyer and seller are negotiating on purchase price and can't agree um, exactly on the numbers, you know what sometimes can make sense is that the um, is that there's an earnout, um, and that's where you know, for example, the seller says, "Hey, I think the business is worth this," and the buyer says, "Well, no, I, I don't think it's worth that," but if the financial performance of the business is strong enough after closing um, and we hit these markers, then we're going to pay you, you know, based on this formula so that you get to the number you're looking for because the business has proved it. Um, and so that's, there's definitely some flexibility in there to be thinking about. Um, sometimes you'll see installment purchases if it's just being, you know, financed by the, the seller, for example. Um, and so, you know, the, the payments might be due incrementally um, over time. Uh, think about what are the purchased assets. Um, you know, even if you're doing a stock deal, you really want to be intentional about identifying what is the key value that I'm buying, um, and do I have something that specifically says, you know, that the seller owns it and that I'm buying it as the buyer and I'm getting it, um, so that I don't have to think about going and proving that they owned it and that they sold it to me, but I'm just looking at the purchase agreement that says I'm selling you everything. Everything includes the attached list. And then I go and I look at the attached list. Um, <clears throat> same, same kind of thought process for excluded assets. Um, you'll frequently see this where a buyer and a seller don't exactly agree on value or where there's some piece of a business that, um, the, that, the, that the seller in particular wants to keep for themselves, that there'll be, that there'll be a, some sort of excluded assets that'll be taken out of the business before closing. And so it's important to identify those and kind of know what that looks like up front. Um, uh, cash, it's, it's very common for cash to be an excluded asset. Um, sometimes it's included. The main thing there is just for the parties to figure out um, what, what does that do for the economics of the deal? Um, is it important that, that cash be included or not? Um, also think about like when you're thinking about liabilities, think about ones that might not immediately strike you like uh, prepaid, uh, prepaid sales. Um, so if you're stepping into a business and, you know, the seller, you, you know, you're the buyer and the seller has, you know, pre-sold services or goods or whatever else, and then has an obligation to fulfill on those and you're taking on the obligation to fulfill on those, you know, how does that impact your deal? How does that impact your need for financing and working capital? Um, you know, and, and have you taken that into consideration? Um, and as a seller, you know, you, you always wanna make sure that you're really clearly disclosing those things um, so that it you don't have a angry buyer <laughs> coming back to you, um, wondering uh, what, what happened and why all these people are coming out of the woodwork, expecting them to do work for, you know, money you made that they don't have. Um, think about excluded liabilities. Um, it's pretty common in a asset uh, transaction to have, or at least generally start with a cash-free, debt-free deal, meaning that the seller is going to keep all their cash and the seller is also going to take care of all their debt and liabilities um, at closing and the buyer is just going to go forward with the assets in the business. Um, if, it's a, if it's a stock transaction, um, you can still have some of those aspects as long as they're handled properly. Um, you just really want to be intentional about understanding what are the liabilities of the business um, and how have we handled those. Um, think through uh, key employees and other business relationships and how are those going to work in the transaction. Um, for example, if you're buying a business, uh, and or if you're selling a business and there is there's a key employee or there's a couple of key employees, you know, that management team or what have you, um, you, you really want to make sure that that is addressed up front if that's important to the deal. Because if the, the business doesn't make sense um, without those people in place, or maybe it's you as the seller or the, the principal owner of the seller, 
um, you want to make sure that those are addressed appropriately early enough in the process to understand that, well, gee, you know, nobody's going to want to uh, come work for this for this buyer because, you know, whatever reason, they've got a track record of, you know, coming in and firing all the employees and selling off the assets. Um, <clears throat> and so that's going to drive down my value, you know, as a seller, you want to be thinking about those before you get too far into negotiations. Um, if you're the buyer, you want to know, okay, I need to know that I can actually work with this person, that they're going to be a good fit with our broader team um, or with, with just me personally. Um, and how's that going to work? Um, and then making sure that there's a clear understanding of how this is going to look in our transaction. Um, is it a requirement that I get an agreement with these key employees um, or these key other business relationships um, in order for the deal to be done um, so that everybody's working um, in the right direction on those items. Um, and you want to think about non-competes and other restrictive covenants um, in the process. And we'll talk about those, a little, Mike will talk about those a little bit more detail um, as we go along. But uh, the <laughs> one, of, one of the 10 commandments of, you know, buying or selling a business is don't fund your competition if you can help it. <laughs> uh, uh, give me a second here. Um, those key restrictive covenants, um, non-compete, non-solicitation, non-disclosure, non-disparagement. Mike, would you just kind of give a quick overview of each of those, please? Yep. 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 Okay, so, um, so for non-competes, uh, typically as the buyer, you'll want to include a non-compete in the deal to restrict the seller from going off and starting a new business just like the one you're buying um, and competing directly with you for a certain amount of time following the transaction. Uh, these are often you know, very important in the M&A context and help to protect the business you're buying. Um, they're also uh, typically more enforceable in the M&A context rather than uh, the employment context. Uh, generally, when including a non-compete in the deal, uh, you want to think about the interest you're protecting um, when considering the duration and the geographic scope. Uh, it may not make too much sense, for example, if you plan on operating the business only in Wichita, uh, but try and go for a nationwide non-compete. Uh, on the non-solicitation, uh, these help to protect the buyer from the seller luring or hiring away customers or employees of the, the acquired company. Uh, it is, a, it is important to think about um, the customers and employees that you want to keep, uh, as Sam kind of touched on earlier, uh, when, when buying the company, and that should be part of the deal. Uh, on non-disclosure, uh, Sam touched on this in, in the early negotiation stage a bit, but you also, uh, when buying the business, the parties um, generally will, will share uh, confidential information with each other. Um, non-disclosure or confidentiality Confidentiality agreements help to protect the flow of information by obligating the parties to not disclose confidential information to other others or, or use the information in certain ways. Uh, these can be, you know, one way or mutual, which is the best fit may depend on the, the specific parties that, and the, the structure of the deal. Uh, for example, a one way NDA may make more sense if the seller does not intend to receive any confidential information from the buyer. Um, and, and typically when drafting and negotiating these restrictive covenants, uh, it's important to focus on the interests that are important to you and, and how to protect those interests. Uh, on non-disparagement, non uh, these clauses protect the, the business from, from the seller, um, saying anything negative about, about you or saying anything negative about the buyer or the, or the business in any form. Uh, these are meant to be a bit broader than defamation, as defamation typically applies to false statements, where non-disparagement applies to all negative statements, even if uh, they are true. So it can be a good way to protect the value and reputation of the, the, the business you're buying. Um, overall, these restrictive governments help to protect the value and uh, of the acquired company and reduce the risk that the seller could reduce the value uh, after the transaction is closed. Thanks, Mike. You know, if you're on the sell side of a transaction, um, you want to be really diligent in thinking through each of these provisions and thinking about how they're going to affect your life on the other side of the transaction. Um, if, for example, you have plans to go start another business, 
um, that has any similarity at all with um, the business that you're selling, uh, you certainly want to be thinking about that and thinking about how is that going to affect, how is this deal and this non-compete going to affect my ability to go execute on my plans? And is that something where I either, you know, need to change my plans, delay my plans, or where I just need to have, you know, a conversation with the buyer about, hey, here's what I'm thinking about doing. Um, it's really important that I be able to continue to do this. This is going to be necessary for me to do the deal is to make sure that I have the freedom to do this. You know, if you know that's something you want to keep open, you really need to think about having that conversation early in the process. Um, and of course, you always want to be thinking about how sensitive is the information, the idea, everything else. You know, definitely consult with your your, your professional advisors before, you know, sharing that with somebody. But you don't, you usually don't want to be in a position where last minute, you know, before the deal closes, you're trying to get something added in there that the other party is going to see as a substantial change to the deal um, because they may have financing that's tied up in having, you know, a broad enough set of restrictive covenants on you and that might under, undermine their ability to even close on the deal, even if they're fine with it. Um, so you just want to be real proactive about everything that's really important to you to get the deal done. Um, you also want to think about transition services. Um, <clears throat> when you know you're buying or selling the business, you got to think about how does this actually move over to the buyer, and what is necessary for that to happen. Um, if you're the seller and you're financing any part of the deal, or um, you are um, uh, providing any kind, or, or your total purchase price is at all dependent upon the financial performance of the business after the closing, you should care about this a whole lot um, because you want to make sure that it's a really effective, smooth, swift transition um, so that uh, you know you get paid. <laughs> you get paid as much as you can on the deal. Um, and certainly for the buyer, you know, similar interest, you want it to be a smooth, efficient transfer. You, know, you want it to work out really well for everyone involved, but you need to make sure that things work properly. And so you definitely want to talk that through. How long is the seller or the key people on the sell side going to be around so that they can make sure that things um, function properly, that, you know, introductions are made, um, you know, they're available to answer questions because there's always just the practical day-to-day -day things where, hey, what happened with this? You know, how does this piece work um, that are going to come up? And you want to make sure that there's a clear expectation and a clear right or obligation um, on the parties to take care of that. And then always be thinking about what else, you know, what other terms are important for making this deal work for us and work properly. Um, any questions so far, folks? I'm not seeing any questions so far. Great. Um, so you are the captain of your team and uh, you can certainly delegate that responsibility to somebody else, but you need to think about yourself as being the captain of your team and it's your uh, responsibility and it's your opportunity to articulate to your team, here's exactly what I'm looking for. Here's what I want you to achieve. Here's the parameters. Um, here's the communication flows. Here's our timing. Here's everything else. Um, and then get your team to go execute on things. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, so, so you're definitely on your team. You want to be thinking about who is, who is a really good, sharp accountant, uh, tax advisor that's going to help you make sure to understand the tax ramifications of your deal um, so that you uh, hopefully minimize the, well, let me put it this way, you maximize, the, you know, if you're on the buy side, the value of the asset that you're buying. Uh, and you minimize the tax bill associated with it. Um, think about having your wealth manager involved, um, whether you're on the sell side or the buy side. Um, you know, the more proactive you are with that relationship, um, the more creative and the more purposeful they can be. Um, hey, let's think about this timing with these planning items. Or if you're on the buy side, there might even be financing options you can look at through you know, your 401k or IRA or, or some other um, investment that you have access to. Um, you definitely want to have an attorney on your team. Um, you know, when to get all of these people involved is going to vary from deal to deal. Um, generally speaking, the sooner the better, even if it's just, hey, I'd like to take you out for coffee or grab lunch with you sometime, pick your brain on something I'm thinking about coming up here. You want to start that dialogue so that you can move quickly when the deal um, starts to really get moving. Um, 
uh, if you're financing the deal using any kind of bank financing, um, you really, or if you have any kind of bank financing that's going to be in place for the business to operate, um, you really want to have a good banker on your team. Um, somebody that's going to understand the business, understand the deal, be able to help make valuable suggestions and say, hey, I really think you need to think about this kind of line of credit or why don't we move this financing piece over here or what have you. Um, you, you need to make sure, especially that those folks are involved early enough um, that if your deal is time sensitive, they have enough uh, enough lead time to be able to get things through underwriting um, with with a sufficient amount of time um, for your closing. Um, you know, I can't tell you the number of times, the number of deals I've worked on where folks have gotten an initial um, indication from their banker that, hey, this this seems like something we can do. And then, you know, a couple conversations later, that has turned into from, you know, the buyer's perspective, um, this is approved. This is definitely going to happen. There's no risk at all involved um, with financing. It's just a done deal. Um, and sometimes that's true and sometimes that's not. Um, what I encourage folks to think about is until you've gotten a official approval letter or, or a commitment letter or something from the bank that says that this is approved, this is done, if it's gotta go through SBA, we've gotten SBA approval, whatever it might be, um, you just really wanna make sure that's actually a done deal if getting to that point is necessary for um, you to do the deal. Because um, you don't wanna end up either spending a bunch of your time and money on a deal um, under, a, under a false assumption there. And you also don't want the other party to do the same. Um, uh, so just make sure you're getting out in front of that as quickly as possible and make sure to ask your banker the hard questions of, you know, what is, you know, what are the remaining steps to getting to closing here? What's the remaining steps for underwriting? What, what's actually left to get done on this transaction? Um, you, you really want to think about having industry experts involved. Um, particular, this is more relevant if you're on the buy side. If you're on the sell side, then unless you um, have not been, unless you've been a passive owner and haven't really been involved, um, then you know you're probably not looking. You probably are the industry expert on your team. Um, but on the, on the buy side, unless you're already heavily involved in that business, you know you really want to be thinking about having industry experts involved. Some, somebody, you know, maybe it's a consultant or an advisor who's coming alongside you um, to really help you understand and contextualize um, a lot of what it is that you're, you're buying and understanding. Um, uh, think about uh, having your insurance agent on your team uh, early as well. Um, you're going to need to make sure that you've got insurance in place, uh, particularly if you're on the, on the business. Uh, or if you're buying on the buy side, you, you're going to make sure that your insurance agent is involved enough, early enough in the process um, that they can get you through underwriting and have insurance in place when your deal closes. Um, think about any other key personnel that are necessary to be involved. Um, if you are the owner of the business and there's key people on your team that have access to, you know, financial information that's going to be necessary to disclose to the buyer, um, you know, operational information. They're going to need to have relationships because the buyer is going to hire them. Um, if you're on the buy side and you're bringing in somebody to run the business, you probably want to think about uh, really hard about having that person um, be involved in the transaction itself so that they can really start to think deeply about what is it, what is it that we're buying and how is this going to work and uh, they're just going to bring a really valuable perspective to the team for you. Um, and then, you know, always ask the question of who else do I need on my team uh, to make sure that things get done. Um, I think, Mike, we need, we need a sushi chef on our team to get things done. <laughs> <I agree. laughs> uh, when, <laughs> Uh, quick side story, folks. Uh, when when we started our firm in June of 2019, several months before pandemic, because you know we didn't see that coming, <laughs> uh, we started right above a sushi restaurant, and it was awesome. Love sushi. Um, I wish I could take a poll here. I'd ask how many people love sushi. If you feel like chiming in on the chat with your favorite sushi, that's that's very welcome. We're always looking to try new sushi places. Um, all right, let's talk about letters of intent and term sheets. Um, uh, I love Zoom. It's so easy. I don't have to move. I don't have to go anywhere. But one of the things I do not like about Zoom is I'm, I like to ask people questions and I like to ask them to raise their hands and do informal polls and stuff like that. And I need to, I need to figure out how to do that more proactively through Zoom. Um, <clears throat> 
was going to ask you all how many of you have done uh, have been a party to a letter of intent or a term sheet. Um, oh, it looks like we may have a sushi suggestion. Let's see. Uh, do they offer chicken, pork, or veggie sushi? Uh, there is veggie veggie sushi, um, depending on whether, you, whether or not you're talking about vegan sushi might be another thing. Um, one of my favorite, and this is from Jason, um, one of my favorite um, uh, favorite kinds of sushi is uh, one that has cucumber and um, uh, cream cheese in it. I can't remember for the life of me what it's called right now. Uh, but uh, it's very good. I, I don't know if I've seen chicken or pork pork sushi, but there's definitely some uh, some more vegetarian options um, in there. Yep. Uh, allergic to shrimp and self shellfish. Yeah, you you probably want to avoid most sushi places because I don't know if they if cross contaminants are an issue for you. That might be a problem. Um, give me just a second here. Um, so the real objective with a letter of intent or a term sheet. Um, is to make sure that everyone is on the same page enough to actually go do the deal. Um, if you don't have um, enough clarity around key terms um, to make sure that everybody really has the same understanding of the deal, um, then you know you you create a substantial risk that everyone wastes their time and money. Um, and doing these deals can get pretty expensive pretty fast. And and the biggest expenditure isn't necessarily the cash that you spend on a deal, though that can certainly be substantial, um, but more so it's your time. You know, you could be spending your time, if you're on the seller, if you're the seller, you could be spending your time growing your business and making it more valuable or spending more time with your family um, and the same same on the buyer side. Um, so that's, so it's really important to make sure that that's, that's your clear objective is I want to know that everybody is close enough on the key terms to make sure that this is this is likely enough to happen for us all to do the hard work to make the deal happen. Um, the difference between a letter of intent and a term sheet is sometimes just spelling. <laughs> um, either one can really do um, can do can serve a similar function, and I've certainly done deals before where there wasn't a formal term sheet, there wasn't a formal letter of intent, it was an exchange of emails with bullet points saying, hey, here's here's what we're planning to do. Um, <clears throat> and here's what we've, you know, agreed that we're, you know, we're going to try to work towards as part of this deal. Um, the real main thing is to make sure that it's non-binding um, so that you don't have an accidental contract when there really isn't enough information to make sure for certain that it actually works, um, at least not one that's worth undertaking with the kind of dollars and risks that are involved. Um, and do you have enough clarity on terms? I mean, those, those are really the key things is, you know, is it non-binding and do you have enough clarity on the key points to make it work? Um, <clears throat> here's some key elements to think through on these. Um, think through the non-binding deal terms. That might be, you know, some of the things that we've talked about um, in uh, the initial negotiation stage and thinking through, you know, okay, which ones of these are important enough that we're going to put them in and which ones are we not on the same page on that aren't important enough or we just don't, we just don't need to tie it in yet. Um, really be thinking about those. Uh, be thinking about deal timing, um, including are you going to specify a due diligence review period? Um, and are you going to set a, an expected date for closing? Um, you really want to make sure everybody's working towards the same timing um, and that everyone has a shared understanding of how much work is going to go into the deal. Um, if you don't have parties that are both motivated to do the deal or they don't share, you know, back to the dating analogy. <laughs> Um, if, if everyone is not on the same page on timing, <laughs> uh, we're dating for eight years, or we're going to get married in six months, uh, you know, whatever. Um, you know, you can you can really run into some challenges in terms of getting the deal done, um, especially if one of the parties has some um, external significance to the timing of their deal. Um, yeah, for example, right now there's some really cool programs with SBA financing that um, you know are going to really drive the timing on some deals because it's going to save buyers and borrowers a lot of money to get deals done within a particular time window. Um, and if you're a seller and you know you've got um, 
you know, it's just time to be done. You know, you want to, you want to get out, you know, uh, on your terms and on your timing. And so just making sure everybody's on the same page there is, is important and making sure that the deal flows um, correctly with everyone's, uh, or at least close to correctly. I've never been part of a perfect deal. I hope to someday, someday I'll close the deal and be like, everything went flawlessly <laughs> and then I'll probably retire. Um, <laughs> uh, think about binding terms. Um, so even though as a general matter, you want um, letters of intent and term sheets, uh, and you, you wouldn't, just for clarity, you wouldn't typically have both on the same deal. You'd, you'd usually just have one or the other because the purpose is the same um, most of the time. Um, is you, you do want to think about having some binding terms in that document or, or addressed somewhere else. Um, is there uh, confidentiality that's going to protect the information sharing, particularly from the seller? But again, um, as I mentioned earlier, buyers frequently will want to have confidentiality around the discussions um, to, to protect that. Um, you want to think about whether or not there's exclusivity. Um, if I'm on the buy side of a transaction, um, and, and usually just for clarity, ex exclusivity or a no shop is, is intended to protect the buyer. Um, the buyer is going to spend money on getting the deal done. Seller is too, but the buyer will frequently ask for this type of a provision because the buyer wants and needs enough confidence that um, the seller is not going to go sell it to somebody else while I, as the buyer, am spending all this money to get this deal done. I don't want to be surprised at the end with, oh, gee, you know, thanks, uh, but we found somebody who's going to give us more money for it um, or we just like better. Um, uh, so, so definitely think about those and think about a termination provision. Um, a lot of times I'll th see these come across where there's not a termination provision in there. You really want to think, think about that because you've got, you know, risk to having these documents continue to exist. And if, um, and, and that can be risk for the buyer or risk to, to the seller, depending on the circumstances. Um, if the parties are done talking and there's just not a deal here, um, you really want to think about, you know, how do we break the relationship and go forward? And how do we set an expectation around how that works? <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about due diligence. Um, due diligence is a, or can be a laborious process. <laughs> it can be very fun. It can be very rewarding. It's critical. Um, if you're the seller, um, this is a key way for you to protect yourself is to make sure that you've disclosed stuff. If you've got things that make you nervous about your business, you know you probably want to be thinking about how and when you're going to disclose those to a buyer, so that buyer doesn't come back after closing um, or before closing after finding it out um, in a way that, that you don't like um, uh, and expect some you know repayment or, or concession for that. Um, if you're on the buy side, you want to make sure that you've done enough diligence to really understand what you're buying, what are the risks, what's the value. Um, you want to you want to plan you know a couple preliminary items here. You want to plan for a successful process. Think about timing. Think about who's responsible for what. Um, is your legal team handling a you know a legal due diligence request uh, list? Is your you know accountant handling financial? Do you have folks doing operational? Um, <clears throat> you know how is that um, all going to be balanced? Who does everyone have an understanding of what their role is? Um, you really want to understand and be intentional up front with yourself um, and with your team about what are the key what's the key value and the key risks um, that are involved so everyone stays focused on the things you know and certainly there's going to be others that'll come up during the process but so that everybody stays focused on you know what are the things that really matter um, and really matter to you because it's your it's your team it's your process um, you want to be really mindful of ndas in this process um, both if you're making disclosures and you have obligations to third parties that need to be navigated around, um, but also so that you're, you're clear on if I disclose something, is there a process I have to go through um, under our NDA? Do I have marking requirements? What do I need to do to make sure that um, I'm properly following those? Um, uh, virtual data rooms. Um, this is, you know, you'll see folks use Google Drive, Dropbox. Um, there's other more sophisticated uh, more secure um, means of sharing files. It's really just a place um, online to, you know, put information and make sure that um, it's shared and organized appropriately. Um, 
uh, to respond to Jason's question, what is an NDA? Um, an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. Sometimes it's called a confidentiality agreement. Um, real briefly on that, if you're reviewing one, a couple of things you wanna look for is how long does it last? You know, how long is that obligation gonna survive? Um, and how does that affect, you know, what your, your priorities are? Um, think through termination, is there a way to get out? Should there be a way to get out of, of the NDA? Um, and under what circumstances? Um, do, are there marking requirements? Does information, particularly if you're disclosing information, do you have to mark it in a particular way in order to, uh, in order for it to have that protection? Um, and you, you really wanna think through, if you're the person disclosing the information, what happens, what actually happens if the person I'm sharing this with doesn't respect the confidentiality obligation? Um, if it's really sensitive information and you're looking across the table going, I don't know this person and I don't think they can pay me what damage they're gonna cause um, if they disclose this, and I don't think I trust them. You shouldn't be doing a deal with them anyway, <laughs> but you should also um, be thinking about, do you actually wanna share that information? Because if you have, just cause you have a contractual right, if the person that, that has violated that right and now owes you money um, or, or has damages that they owe you, um, can't pay you, then, you know, there's, there's just not, that, that, that right isn't worth a whole lot for you. So always bring your practical real world brain to the table um, when you're thinking about navigating through things like, you know, non-disclosure agreements or really any other, um, really any other contract that you're a party to. Hey, Sam. Yes. We did have somebody ask if you could explain an NDA a little bit. Um, yes. So just uh, was was walking through that just just now. Um, one other um, thing to add to that discussion on on NDAs uh, is uh, the non-use component, um, or what is the permitted purpose or permitted use of the information that's shared. Um, when a um, uh, a good NDA sh often, and of course, you know, generalities. Think about the particular circumstances first. Um, a good NDA should say, hey, here's what you can use the information for. And in a context of buying and selling or selling a business, it should say, you can use the information to evaluate um, and go through the process of deciding whether or not we're gonna do a deal. Um, it should also say, hey, we don't have any obligation to do a deal with each other. Just so we're being clear, we're talking, we don't, we're not making a commitment yet. Um, <clears throat> Just a second here. Um, uh, yeah, so Jason has another question here and thank you for that question, Jason. When we talk contracts, this is Jason's question. When we talk contracts, I think of locks. Locks are only good to keep the honest people out. What if one party doesn't honor the agreement? Can an agreed upon amount of money be put into escrow? Even so, if both parties would have to sign to release funds from escrow and one party doesn't, then what? Um, that's a great question, uh, Jason. So um, as a starting point, you know, every contract really represents a relationship. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, if you don't trust the party on the other side of the deal, then may maybe that's not somebody that you should really do a deal with um, because you're going to have to have a relational component to that contract regardless of what the rights are. And if you if they're not an honest person and you don't trust them and you think they're going to, um, and you don't think that they're going to honor, um, you know, their obligations, then, you know, probably pretty, pretty good indicated that maybe that's not the person you should do the deal with. Um, if they don't honor the agreement, um, you might have the ability to go sue them. Uh, and, you know, if they have enough resources uh, you might ultimately be able to get a legal judgment, assuming that they didn't just immediately go, okay, my bad, let me pay you for your damages. Um, but if you had to go all the way through the legal process, that can take, you know, months or sometimes years to get to a final judgment that you can then go and force against somebody. Um, and by that, by that point, you might have other damages that don't really, um, you know, that, that can't really be fully made whole at that point. Um, and so you really, really need to be aware of that and really need to be thinking about it. Um, you want to give yourself all the reasonable protections you can get um, 
uh, on a deal, especially one like buying or selling a business. Um, but you really got to be careful about who are you doing the deal with. Um, can an agreed amount of money be put into escrow? It absolutely can. Um, and that's definitely something you want to think about early in the process. Um, it's very common even, uh, it's very common I would say on larger deals um, for there to be some kind of escrow where some funds um, are going to be uh, held by a professional escrow agent. Sometimes that's a bank, sometimes it's some other um, third party who is going to have an obligation to distribute those under an escrow agreement. Um, and so sometimes the escrow agreement is, is structured to where um, the parties have to agree that the funds are um, to be distributed in a particular fashion, but other times it'll provide other, other means for those funds to be directed um, in a particular manner. Uh, and that might be, you know, any, any number of things. Um, so um, give me just a second here, but if the parties ultimately didn't, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty common for escrow agents to want to avoid as much liability as possible because they're usually not, relatively speaking, they're usually not getting paid a ton to hold on to people's money and pay it out. And so if they feel uneasy about anything, they'll often have a provision in there that says, hey, you know, we can just do X, Y, and Z with it, you know, for example, hand it over to a court or what have you. So. Um, <clears throat> hey, Sam, we do have one more question. Yeah, absolutely. Is it common for the buyer to want to see your software? Is that if that's the thing that they're buying? And would it be reasonable to share that under an NDA? Um, so, uh, yes. It would be, sorry, give me just a second here. Um, it, it would be very common for if the buyer is buying your, your software for them to want to see the code um, or at least see portions of the code. Um, and so you would definitely wanna have an NDA in place um, to cover that, that kind of disclosure, but you'd also really wanna think about practical controls. Um, if the core value of your business is tied up in your software, um, you, you really want to make sure you're, you're carefully protecting that and think about, you know, how are you going to share that with them? Um, is it something where you actually need to give them access to it? Um, is it something where you can provide, you can find some other appropriate format to show them, you know, the, the necessary pieces? Um, as they go through their process, um, they're often going to want to, um, uh, give, give me just a second here. Sorry, folks. My wife and son were trying to call me for our, our, um, our lunch, our, our, uh, they usually call me around lunchtime. Um, give me just a second here. I'm trying to get back to my, my presentation. Um, but frequently a buyer will want to test things. Um, they'll actually want to um, make sure that they um, that they have enough of an understanding of what it is they're buying and that they've done enough due diligence on it, which often they can't do without appropriate testing, which is going to require some kind of disclosure um, uh, in order to get comfortable that, that it's worth what, what you'd like to be paid for it. Um, so definitely an NDA is necessary, but really think about practical controls. Um, how can you delay actually giving them control over or, or direct access to something until you're far enough into the process to know um, that, you know, this is actually somebody who's legitimate who you want to do a deal with. Um, what, what sometimes gets overlooked um, in due diligence is a seller's due diligence on the buyer. Um, if you're the seller and you're looking at spending money on and sharing information with somebody, you know, you want to think about what kind of due diligence, if any, do I need to do to make sure that I'm comfortable that this person's legit, um, that, you know, they're trustworthy. Um, and a lot of times you'll know them if they're a local buyer, you'll know them by reputation, you'll know people that know them, there'll be, you know, ways to get comfortable there. There might be, you know, disclosure of financial statements or um, bank letters of approval or what have you, or it may just be, a, you know, a parent, you know, uh, Charles Koch, you know, walks into my office and says, Sam, I'd like to buy, you know, this business from you. You know, he couldn't buy the law firm because he's not an attorney, but um, if he wanted to buy the law firm, I'd probably sell it to him. He can work that out on his own. Um, you know, I probably don't need to do a lot of due diligence on the financial side for him. Um, but if it's somebody I don't know who's just kind of, you know, 
shows up. Really want to be be careful about that. So, um, does that does that answer your question on uh, NDAs and and uh, is it customary for the uh, for the software to or for the buyer to want to see the software? Yes, it did. He said awesome. thank you. Yep, very good. Um, <clears throat> Let's talk about initial due diligence. Um, you want to think about that. Here's here's some some things that you want to if you're on the buy side, especially that you want to think about asking for. You know, financial statements and reports, tax returns, asset lists, you know, liability lists and searches. Um, there's third party searches that can that can identify um, if there's liens filed, tax liens, those kind of things. You know, interview key employees and personnel. I mean, that's something where you know that really that item in particular. Um, has to be coordinated with, you know, with both parties because frequently, you know, if you're the seller, you don't want your team knowing about this transaction until, you know, late in the process. And if you're the buyer, you don't want them knowing, you don't want, you know, uh, employees of the seller to know um, because you don't want them to all leave. Um, you know, that team's important um, to running that business and you don't want them to get spooked that they're going to get fired because there's a transaction coming and start looking for other jobs. Um, you, you want to take a look at key contracts. Um, you know, if you're acquiring a business that has 80% um, um, of its, you know, volume or its profitability or whatever, or some some other high number tied up in in a couple of key relationships, you want to look at those contracts and understand, okay, what am I actually getting? What obstacles to getting what I need um, are in these contracts? Um, you want to think about inspecting key locations and assets, um, actually being able to go on site you know, start to see things, see how it works, um, you know, in the software setting, you know, you actually been able to look at those, at those things. Um, and you want to look at governing documents for the seller, particularly if it's an equity transaction, um, what kind of restrictions, rights, um, you know, how is, how is that deal actually going to get done from a legal standpoint on that, in that regard. Um, and you want to start thinking about a list of required consents and approvals. Um, if, you know, there's a governmental license that's involved and, and a, um, a governmental entity has to sign off on the deal. You really want to make sure that that's that's done properly, um, and that you have enough lead time to do that. Um, similarly, in customer or supplier context, if those are critical, uh, and those have got to be you know consents have got to be obtained, you want to make sure you're out in front of that process uh, and that you've got visibility on that. Um, here's some additional due diligence uh, considerations. I won't spend a lot of time on these. Uh, real estate and environmental, depending on whether there's actually dirt involved in the deal. Um, but there may also be obligations if there's a physical space that's leased. Um, think about industry specific uh, issues or regulatory. Be mindful of the market. Um, is this a business that historically has trended upward, but now the market that they're in is, you know, got some significant occurrences coming that are going to drive it down? Um, you know, be, be thinking about those things. Uh, think about employee benefit plans. Uh, if the seller has um, you know, really, uh, you know, nice benefits and you're the buyer and your model is, well, you know, we, we don't do a lot of benefits, then you need to be, need to be aware of that and what that's going to look like and, and make sure you're factoring that into your economic model if you need to continue those. Um, you know, think about, you know, any other tax matters, sales tax compliance. If you're looking at a business that's, you know, got retail operations in multiple states, um, how are those, how is, how is sales tax compliance handled? Um, intellectual property, you know, an, are there antitrust issues? You don't usually run into antitrust issues until, you know, you start getting into, you know, pretty big or, or pretty heavily regulated businesses. Um, <clears throat> think about trends and culture. Um, if you're buying a business that's really dependent on the people that work there um, and, and those are a really important value driver, you want to make sure you understand them. Um, but also to the extent that you're going to, if you're the buyer and you're going to integrate this business with other business operations, um, you really want to understand how those are going to fit um, or, or start thinking about what the plan is for those to fit and how you're going to get a handle on that. Um, uh, think about operations, um, other matters affecting the transition integration and just understanding it. And think through, think through what are the bottlenecks going to be in the process. Third party consents is often one, approvals, um, et cetera. Um, so let's let's talk about documenting the deal, and I'm going to try to move move a little more quickly. Um, go figure. The lawyer gets a little long winded. Um, uh, you'll you'll have a purchase agreement. 
Um, it might be a stock purchase or, or a um, you know ownership units uh, purchase in an LLC. Uh, it could be an asset purchase agreement, depending on the structure of the deal. Um, you might have real estate related agreements. So if you're, you know, depending on the, the assets that you're buying, there might be a need for a separate real estate purchase agreement. Um, could be a lease involved, might be leasing. Uh, if you're the seller and you're going to continue to own the physical facility, um, which which you see from time to time, um, that you might be leasing that um, that building or that property to um, to the to the buyer. It might be purchase options, rights of first refusal, a lot of, a lot of different details that can go into that. Um, <clears throat> think about non-compete and restrictive covenant agreements. I know Mike addressed those earlier. Um, in a sale context, um, it's pretty common for a non-compete to run for um, five years from the closing, or at least in Kansas, that's the max. That's, that's pretty much the max you can go. Um, a lot of attorneys, myself included, will, will frequently go, okay, you know, is that helpful for the interest you're trying to protect? Let's let's see if we can get that um, as a starting place. Uh, sometimes you'll see less, um, just depending on what's customary in that market and what the, the parties are willing to agree to. Uh, you might have employment and service agreements. Uh, if the seller or the, the owner of the seller is going to continue to th to stay on, they might have that kind of an agreement. Um, if you got key employees and that are going to stay with the buyer. Um, it might be a condition or structured part of the deal that those folks are going to have to sign new agreements, um, and those agreements then would, would need to be done as part of the deal. Um, if the seller is providing part of the financing on the transaction, um, then uh, you know, there needs to be at least a promissory note. There might need to be security agreements involved. There might need to be agreements between the seller and the bank. Um, the bank may want something that says, hey, we're the bank. <laughs> we are providing the primary financing and you can get paid seller under these conditions after we get paid. Or, you know, here's here's what markers have to be met in order for you to get paid um, simultaneous with us. Uh, third party consents. Yeah, you know, there's usually some documentation that goes into those to make sure that, uh, you know, those approvals are appropriately obtained. Um, lien releases. Um, you know, getting those from if, if, for example, the seller has financing in place and there are liens on those assets, um, there need to be releases obtained um, at closing when those folks get paid off. Um, you really, as a buyer, you really want to avoid buying any assets that have liens on them, um, unless that's just the nature of the transaction. Um, so you just really want to really want to be aware of those. We talked a little bit about escrow agreements um, a little bit ago. Uh, and there's ancillary documents. Uh, you're probably thinking to yourself, Sam, what does ancillary mean? Nobody uses that. Why are lawyers jerks and using <laughs> using a language that nobody else uses? Um, uh, so this would be all the miscellaneous, and that would probably be a, a better word, Mike, for me to use. Uh, miscellaneous documents that are part of the deal. Um, it could be, uh, you know, third party. It could, excuse me. It could be like minute, like corporate minutes. To approve the transaction, it could be uh, bills of sales, assignment agreements, um, just all the other little stuff that makes the deal happen. Um, yeah, domain registration assignments, um, little, little stuff like that. Um, as you're thinking through this transaction uh, and these documents, think about the owner of the seller's individual role. Um, is the the owner of the seller going to um, excuse me, uh, are they going to be personally obligated for the um, reps and warranties of the seller? Um, and, and if you're the seller or you're the owner of the seller, is that something that you're willing to do? Because um, that needs to be thought through upfront if that's not something you really wanna do. Um, the reason it's important to think through is like if you're the buyer and you're getting all these representations and warranties about ownership of the assets and everything else from, an, from a seller that is actually a legal entity, and then, you know, at closing, you know, the, the, the owner of the seller is going to, you know, typically, you know, distribute out all or most of that money out to themselves um, after that transaction. If you have a claim down the road as the buyer, um, you know, there's probably not a lot of assets left there to go after um, on the actual legal seller, you know, being the legal entity. And so frequently, um, and it's pretty customary, you'll see um, the owner having uh, some personal liability in the deal, um, at least up to a certain point to 
um, stand behind the obligations legally and from a liability standpoint um, of the seller entity. And so be, be thinking about um, those and what your those those uh, issues and what you're comfortable with as the buyer and the seller. Hey Sam. Yes. We do have a question. Um, could so could you say a little bit more about seller owner financing? Is this financing related to the transaction costs or something else? Um, so it can uh, it can be part of the purchase price. Um, it's it's pretty common. Um, you know, particularly on small business acquisitions for the seller to finance part of the deal um, and effectively accept a promissory note for part of the purchase price from, um, excuse me, from the, from the buyer. Uh, and sometimes you'll see that if the buyer doesn't have, you know, quite the amount of cash necessary um, to make the deal work or if they're having, uh, if there's a disagreement with the bank about the exact valuation of the business and what the bank is willing to finance um, and uh, so it's a pretty it's a pretty customary part of some deals. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'd say one of the key issues to think about early in the process, and this is why you know having a good banker on your team is really important, is if there's SBA financing involved, there's limitations, and certainly if there's other types of financing involved, there can be limitations as well on how much of the financing can be in the form of of seller financing. And I, I can't remember if it's five percent or ten percent, but it's, you know, it's, so, it's somewhere in that range. Um, and so you you really need to be on top of that, be mindful of that. Um, when it comes to seller financing and uh, and the interplay between that and bank financing, <clears throat> you want to have conversations early on in the process um, with the with the banker to understand. Okay, what is the bank going to require on on repayment terms here? Because sometimes the bank will say, "Hey, we've got to get paid in full before the seller can get paid anything under this promissory note." And if you're the seller and you're fine with that, then that's great. But if not, you want to know that as early in the process as possible, um, so that uh, and not that it won't change during the process because sometimes it does. Um, but you just want to know um, at, at far enough in advance so that you can spot the issues and. Um, if it's just not going to work, you want to know that as quickly as possible so you can pull the plug and move on. Um, does that does that help with those questions? Yep, it's a thank you. Great. Um, so let's talk about what happens after the deal. Um, we've talked a little bit about transition services. Um, you know, that's where the seller or the owner of the seller or other key folks involved on the sell side are are providing services to help transition the business to the buyer. Um, one of the key things to think about there is, is that just wrapped into the purchase price and I'm the buyer and I've already paid for it and you have to do it for free? Um, or is it something where, you know, I'm actually going to hire you um, as a seller to stay on for a while and do all this stuff and here's how I'm going to pay you? Or is it going to be some blend of both? Um, and so you want to be upfront with that because that can take a lot of time and you don't want to have any you know unexpressed unmet expectations on a point as significant as that? Um, you want to think about um, hiring and onboarding employees. Um, how is that going to work? Um, it's pretty common on an asset deal, for example, um, for the seller to have an obligation to go fire everybody right before closing, um, and it's usually a nice firing. Hey, everybody! Look, you don't work for me anymore. This person here wants to hire you. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> um, and often it is, and sometimes it's not. Um, you think through all of that in advance. Um, uh, but you want to know what that process is going to look like. You want to have somebody teed up on your team to you know, help on with onboarding, you know, getting documents signed, um, you know, employment agreements, you know, policy and handbook, um, acknowledgements, you know, benefits set up, all that stuff. Um, you want to think about integrating your systems. Um, don't, you know, the, all that operational stuff that's got to happen on the back end of the deal, you want to make sure that that's teed up to actually take place. Um, customer, supplier, and other key introductions. Some of those will need to happen before the deal closes because there's a ne it, it's necessary to get a consent. Um, uh, but if it's not happened before before closing, you want to think through what is that process going to look like? Who's going to be involved? How are we going to make sure this is a smooth transition? Um, 
with things like uh, press releases and announcements. Um, sometimes the party want, parties want the world to know, this is great, we're all celebrating this, what a cool thing. And sometimes nobody wants anybody to know about it. <laughs> uh, they just want it business as usual, we're going to continue to go on uh, with our lives and, and we don't want you know, any big press releases. Um, when, when you're in a big small town like Wichita, word's going to get out, <laughs> it's just going to happen. Um, and so, you know, don't, don't expect that even preventing a press release is going to avoid that entirely. Um, but at a minimum, if there is some kind of press release you want to think about or the party is going to agree that, hey, if you're going to do a press release, that's fine, but I've got to look at it and approve it first kind of thing, or we're going to write one together, what is that going to look like? Um, and then be prepared that you know, you're going to do your best to plan for a successful transition, um, a successful integration, you know, for your on the sell side to move it over and make it a, a smooth process and wind down things on your end. Um, of, of the spectrum and on the buyer that you, you're going to do your best to kind of move it over appropriately. But, um, you know, it's, it's like I mentioned earlier, there's no perfect deals. Um, uh, and so there's always going to be loose ends. Um, and you just need to go in knowing that there's going to be loose ends um, and being mentally prepared um, and financially prepared sometimes um, to be able to roll with that as it comes up. So. Um, and with that, um, what other questions do folks have that we can we can help y'all with? I'm not currently seeing any more questions. Great. Well, we're happy to hang out here for a couple more minutes and field any questions as they come in. Um, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention today, and I hope this has been helpful. Um, we would appreciate any and all feedback. Um, we love love working with folks in this space, um, and certainly want to you know keep doing presentations like this to create value for folks. And so, if there's any any feedback y'all have on how we can create more value or other topics you'd like to hear from uh, from us on, we'd we'd love to love to be a part of that. So, Th thanks, Susanna. Have a great have a great uh, great day. Maybe give it another minute and any other comments or questions and then uh, um, we'll go from there. I see a Q&A there, Mindy, but I can't, for some reason, I can't open it on this end. It's, uh, it was just someone saying it was a great presentation and thank you. Oh, cool. Well, we always like to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> Aside from that, I do not see any more questions. I think we're good to go. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, stay cool today. Uh, Mindy and Marsha, thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk to folks uh, today. Appreciate you all. Have Thank a great you. one. Thank you.